you know, David, I told you don't bring up that hadith tonight. You know, I gave him advice, don't bring up that hadith, but this is all part of an Islamist conspiracy. You know, we're just here to impose Sharia law, and uh, you have forced my hand tonight. Actually, yeah, he's right, you know, there is a lot of verses which teach us to fight, and um, I pointed out to you why we should fight. To fight the good fight, chapter uh, 4, verse 75. And what is wrong with you, that you fight not in the cause of Allah, for those are weak, oppressed among men, women, and children, whose cry is, Our Lord, rescue us from this town whose people are oppressors. Did he refute that? He did not refute that. So that argument, you can, if you have this uh, paper here, I think I give it to everyone, you can find it on the website, examinethetruth.com, and a uh, forward slash wood to find that. So you can go ahead and check that off. That is an unrefuted argument. So it's a very important part of jihad, which he conveniently did not address tonight. So yeah, absolutely. You know, fighting is such a great thing in Islam. But when you look at the reasons for it, then I think that justifies it. Now, let me go ahead and address this hadith which you quoted. That I have been ordered to fight against the people until they testify that, you know, there's no God but Allah, and if they do so, their property is safe, etc. You see, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it almost, it's almost like he saw in the future that people will be misrepresenting this hadith and using this. So that's why he had Kab B. Malik explain this hadith. And let me read this to you. It says, we shall fight as long as we live till you turn to Islam. Now, that almost sounds like exactly what David Wood is saying, right? We should fight you as long as we live till you turn to Islam. Do you agree with that statement? That's what Islam teaches? Uh, please, no uh, oh, I'm sorry about that. Okay. okay, well, now read the verse right before it. If you offer peace, we will accept it and make you partners in peace and war. If you refuse, we will fight you. We shall fight as long as we live till you turn to Islam. So let me repeat that again. If you offer peace, we will accept it and we will make you partners in peace and war. Partners in peace and war, that's like a, a profit sharing scheme. Basically, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, defined it as that we live together in equality. So yes, the option for war is there. But the option for peace is also there. So I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. This debate is over from this point. Because it has been proven, yes, there's option for war. But that's why Muhammad وسلم, had Kabi Malik explain the hadith very clearly. We will, if you offer us peace, we will accept it. What don't you understand about that? So he needs to come tonight and he needs to address that. So let's move on to some of the other arguments which he has raised. You see, he has actually misrepresented the Quran. He said in chapter 9, verse 30, it says why you should fight against Muslims. It says because, and the Jews say, Uzair is the son of Allah. And the Christians say, Messiah is the son of Allah. That's the reason why. That's not what the Quran says. He has misrepresented what the Quran teaches. It's criticizing, criticizing the Christians for what they believe. But the verse does not say, because... They believe in that. That's why you should fight them. That's not what the verse says. Let's move on to some of the other points over here. He says the reason is to fight them is to make money. That's, that's, that's the reason why. It's just to make money. You see? And because of this canard, Prophet Muhammad also addressed that inside, inside Sirah Ibn Ishaq. It says over there that the people came to Prophet Muhammad <coughs> They say, we will make you the king of Arabia. We will give you all of the riches. If, but Muhammad said, I am not interested. That is not my intention tonight. He said, that is not what he wants. Okay? But this goes back to my argument. I said tonight, the Christians were clear and present danger. That if not confronted, would unleash a brutal campaign of genocide torture, and barbarianism. Did he refute that tonight? He did it. They are a clear present danger. But what he's saying is, this is a spectacular coincidence, Muhammad didn't mean to confront that clear and present danger. But yes, that was there. It is true. But do you see his argument tonight? He's arguing that this, 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 this is all a coincidence. <laughs> that, yeah, I know the Jews, the Christians did massacre the Jews like that. And, and uh, that is a clear and present danger. 
Well, my argument tonight is, that's no coincidence. That's not a coincidence. And we, if, we, if we still persist, no, no, dear, that's a coincidence. Then I can go ahead and give him scripture to show that's not a coincidence. Let's see how he did on the arguments. Actually, let me continue uh, just kind of refuting some of the uh, verses. He said, Jews are included in that verse to fight. Absolutely. Remember, I told you the Jews slaughtered 20,000 Christians. He quoted Ibn Kathir and said, all people should be called to Islam. And if they do not, they should be fought and they should be killed. Do you know why he quoted Ibn Kathir? Can't find that in the Quran. Didn't he say Muhammad was the best interpreter? I challenge him to find that in the Quran. But it, it doesn't matter now. It doesn't matter because I've already given you the hadith. If you offer peace, we will accept it and make you partners in peace and war. So the argument in itself is irrelevant. Okay? Let's move on. He was talking about the Taliban. Really? Taliban represents Islam? I didn't know that. And he talked about the Muslim outrage. I don't believe that represents Islam. The subject is about what Islam teaches about peace and violence. Okay? He said he's being accused of being a hate uh, monger and a bigot. And yes, you are. Yes, you are. Because, you see, this is the difference between myself and David Roy. When I argue things, I'm arguing you to bring you to Islam. I'm arguing you to, to leave Christianity. But it's not true. He argues the same thing for his religion, but he goes one step further. He targets Muslims, and, and he argues those people are a threat. They are try, They are got a conspiracy. To spread, is, to spread the Sharia law, and by that, yes, absolutely, because you're using apologetics to target uh, the immigrants. So let's uh, let's keep moving on. Um, it's, uh, so he said inside like chapter nine, verse seventy-three. Oh, I'm sorry, one verse which he actually uh, quoted: Islam teaches to be severe against the non-Muslims. We'll address that because I only got like what thirty seconds. But remember the nine, the seven points which I've raised here. Did he really refute those arguments? He actually refuted nothing. Uh, I, we talked about the false presupposition. We talked about that there is a moral obligation to fight against the disbeliever. He did not refute that. He said that we talked about that Islam teaches a golden rule. He did not refute that. I talked about how Islam, actually, the violence in Islam, made the world a better place by bringing science to this, to this world and, and opening up the doors of science for Europe. He did not refute that. Um, and then I also talked about that they were a clear and present danger. He's basically agreeing with me, but he just saying, well, that, that's just a coincidence. Muhammad really meant to do something else. That was his argument. So tonight, all seven arguments you have written down there have gone unrefuted. Every argument, that's my time. Okay, every argument went unrefuted. All right, let's review. Nadir says that the violent passages of the Quran were revealed so that Muslims could go out and fight all the violent Christians and Jews to end all the violence. Now, um, I won't even deny for purposes of, of this debate that there were violent Christians and Jews. What I'm claiming is that according to the sources he is quoting, according to the Quran and the Hadith, fighting the unbelievers had nothing to do with them being violent. It had to do with their beliefs. They're not accepting Islam. They're uh, believing all kinds of false doctrines according to Islam. That's why you fight them. That's what you find in the Muslim sources. So, what's the problem with uh, Nadir's response? Well, as I pointed out, the Quran claims to be clear. If Allah really meant what Nadir said, why wouldn't Allah have said, I want you to go fight those violent Christians who are engaging in genocide fight them, defeat them, and then come back and leave everyone alone and live in peace. No, instead, Allah, who claims that his book is perfectly clear, says, go fight the unbelievers. Fight those who do not believe in Allah over the last day. That's who you fight. Well, if you say Allah really meant X when he said something totally different, Nadir is actually telling us that he can speak more clearly than his God. Allah really meant, and then Nadir says something that I understand perfectly. I can understand that. Why couldn't Allah have put it that way? And if he did, if Allah did say all kinds of things that he didn't really mean, why did he then go on to claim over and over and over again, like a beating drum, that these commands are perfectly clear? It doesn't make a lot of sense. Nadir brings up Surah 475, early Medinan Surah. 
Uh, nothing in Surah 475 is contradicted by later commands to fight. It's just saying, yes, you need to worry about your Muslim brothers and so on who are being persecuted. Take care of them. Right. I don't deny that Islam commands that. But that doesn't change the fact that later on, Muhammad commanded his followers to fight people simply because they're unbelievers. Um, Quran, verse 930. Nadir says, well, what connection is there? It says, go out and fight the unbelievers. And the very next verse says, well, the Jews say that uh, Ezra is the son of God, and the Christians say Jesus is the son of God. May Allah destroy them. What's that have to do? What's that have to do with the previous verse, which commands Muslims to fight them? Well, don't take my word for it. This is how your classical Muslim interpreters interpreted this. What does Ibn Kathir say in response to this? Fighting the Jews, this is commentary on Surah 930. Fighting the Jews and Christians, of verse 929, is legislated because they are idolaters and disbelievers. Allah encourages the believers to fight the disbelieving Jews and Christians who utter this terrible statement and utter lies against Allah the Exalted. As for the misguidance of the Christians over Isa, it is obvious. So Nadir wants to say Ibn Kathir got it wrong. Well, why did Ibn Kathir get this wrong? Let's assume Ibn Kathir was wrong. Why did he get it wrong? Because Allah says, go out and fight those Jews and Christians, and then the very next verse says, they deny core teachings of Islam. Ibn Kathir says, that really sounds like I'm supposed to fight them because of what they believe, which happens to be exactly what Surah 929 says. If Nadir wants to say Ibn Kathir came to the wrong conclusion, why did Ibn Kathir come to the wrong conclusion? Because Allah just wasn't clear enough in his perfectly clear book. You don't see the problem. Uh, think about it for a little while. Nadir says that Muslims are allowed to seek peace. If other people want to live in peace, Muslims are supposed to live in peace with them. Well, sorry, that was abrogated by Surah 4735, which reads, Be not weary and faint-hearted, crying for peace when you should be uppermost. Tafsir of Ibn Kathir. Ibn Kathir says that this verse means Muslims shouldn't compromise, seek peace, or end fighting with non-Muslims when Muslims are in a position of power. He says, if the, if the disbelievers are considered more powerful and numerous than the Muslims, then the general commander may decide to hold a treaty if he judges that it entails a benefit for the Muslims. This is like what Allah's messenger did when, when the disbelievers obstructed him from entering Mecca and offered him a treaty in which all fighting would stop before, them, before 10 years. Consequently, he agreed to that. Notice what he says. You don't stop fighting the unbelievers unless they're just stronger than you, and then you can have a temporary peace until you're strong enough to fight them. But what does the verse say? You don't seek peace. You're not allowed to seek peace when you should be uppermost. That's what the Quran says. That's not me. Now let's go through these verses one more time. Fight those who believe not in the law, nor the last day. According to Nadir, again, what that really means is fight people who are engaging in genocide. Fight all these people who are doing evil deeds. But when Allah wants to say it, it comes out, fight those who do not believe. So Allah wants to say one thing, but Allah just can't get his words right, according to Nadir. Now think about this. Think about this. The U.S. military is fighting Muslim terrorists, right? That's true. Now suppose the President of the United States wants to issue a command to go and fight a particular group of Muslim terrorists. And when he issues the command, he says, go fight Muslims. Go kill Muslims. Would you not immediately say, Mr. President, you need to be a little more clear than that. You need to clarify exactly which Muslims you're talking about here, because someone might get the wrong idea and might say, I'm just supposed to go around killing Muslims. Well, if Allah wants Muslims to go and fight some really, really bad people, why didn't he say, go fight those really, really bad people, instead of go fight those who do not believe, so that Muhammad, Prophet, and the greatest Muslim interpreters all conclude what this really means is we're supposed to go out and fight unbelievers, exactly what the verse says. <coughs> now that verse, Nadir asked, well, where does the Quran say what Ibn Kathir said? Think about the connection here. You open the Quran, it says, fight those who do not believe in Allah. You open up the Hadith, you see Muhammad's interpretation. I have been commanded to fight people until they say, La ilaha illallah. And if they say it, then they're protected. But not until then. 
And then we turn to Ibn Kathir and says, therefore all people of the world should be called to Islam. If any one of them refuses to come or refuses to pay the jizya, they should be fought till they are killed. Well, where did the Quran say that? Surah 929, Surah 973, 9123, 911. And then we turn to the, the Hadith. You see it in Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Sunan an nasai You see it over and over and over again. But the difference between someone like Ibn Kathir and the deer is Ibn Kathir is a classical Muslim commentator, not someone born and raised in the United States of America. So he had no Western values uh, affecting his influence of the Quran. So someone like Ibn Kathir comes to these passages in the Quran. Wait a minute, Allah is clear. I open up my Quran, what does it say? Fight those who do not believe in Allah. It's not my place to tell Allah what he really means. But Western Muslims are in a different place. They treat the Quran like it's a Chinese buffet. You take what you like and leave what you don't. Unfortunately for them, their religion just does not allow them to do that. I mean, our country allows them to do that, but their religion excludes them as Muslims. That is innovation, and it is strictly condemned in Islam. As I said, the debate is over. Go home, David. It's over. The Hadith is very clear. If you offer peace, we will accept it. And we'll make you partners in peace and war, in which we live together in equality, profit sharing scheme as well. If you refuse, we will fight you. We shall fight you as long as we live till you turn to Islam. The debate is over. Come on, it's over now. It's very clear that yes, there is the option for war in Islam, but there's also an option for peace. If they ask you for peace, we must accept it. And Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam made sure to make it clear to the audience tonight. He had Kabi Malik stand up and recite the creed of jihad. He didn't even bother to respond to this hadith. You see, he keeps talking about what Ibn Kathir. I think it's clear now for the room and for everybody. There's no verse in the Quran or in the teachings of Muhammad or in anything in any of our canonical scriptures which teaches that all people must be fought. There's no such teaching like that. It's not from scripture. It's from a commentary. He tried to pull this down to a Sheikh Abu Bakri. And you know what he told him? He told him, David, a commentary is not evidence in Islam. And I'm going to say the exact same thing. David, a commentary is not evidence in Islam. He's quoting a commentary. It must be backed up with scripture. That statement is not backed up with scripture. But is that so the question is why is why is Ibn Kathir saying this thing? See I think this is the problem. Ibn Kathir, he's just writing a very brief synopsis on each verse of the Quran. It's not a book of fatawa. It's just a commentary. Okay? He's hanging on to a commentary because he cannot find the statement in the Quran or from the teachings of Muhammad that all people should be fought if they do not embrace Islam. So, you see, Ibn Kathir is not going to disagree with us. He's not going to disagree with me. He just, I mean, it's just a very brief commentary. Ibn Kathir does not address the issue. What if non-believers are peaceful people, they don't want to bother anybody, and they're seeking peace? What do you do then? In this situation, he doesn't address that. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had Kabi Malik stand in front of everybody tonight and tell them what is the creed of jihad. So the debate is basically over. Let's go over the arguments tonight, which he was not able to answer tonight. It is clear tonight for everyone, the Christians were in clear and present danger that if not confronted, would unleash a brutal campaign of genocide, torture, and barbarianism until all knees are bent to Christ. Surah 9 verse 29 came to meet this challenge and did fight so that people can have a right Well, Nadir is interpreting Muhammad's uh, claim in a very interesting way. What does Muhammad say? I have been commanded to fight people until they say, La ilaha illallah, perfectly clear claim. But Muhammad meant something very different according to Ka. But wait a minute. I can't quote him in Kathir, but he can quote Ka. I have no objections, though. Because Nadir interprets this, 
in this way. Yes, I'm going to fight you, but if you want to live in peace, I'll live in peace. Well, how do you live in peace with Muslims? There's only way, one way to live in peace with the Muslims. What does Surah 3, verse 85 say? And whoever seeks a religion other than Islam, it will never be accepted of him, and in the hereafter he will be one of the losers. Notice, there are two, there's a separation between this world and the hereafter. It will never be accepted of him, and then in the hereafter he'll be in trouble. Muslims are not going to accept another religion. So if the Muslims go out, and what does Muhammad say? I fight until they say, La ilaha illallah. If you want to live in peace with the Muslims, yes, but you have to say it. And if you want another religion, it'll never be accepted from you. Now, Nadir says that Ibn Kathir gets all of this wrong, and that Ibn Kathir isn't evidence. Well, that's not exactly how I'm using Ibn Kathir. I'm not using Ibn Kathir to say, you see, this is official Islamic doctrine. The way I'm using Ibn Kathir goes more like this. Ibn Kathir goes with the most straightforward interpretation of these texts. If you say Ibn Kathir is wrong, it's because these texts were ambiguous, misleading, unclear. And if you're saying these verses of the Quran, fight those who do not believe in Allah, are misleading and unclear and should be reworded, well then you've just contradicted the Quran, which says that these verses are perfectly clear. Islam doesn't allow Muslims like Nadir to reinterpret these commands. That's why Ibn Kathir goes with the straightforward interpretation. So I think I really understand Nadir's position this evening. It goes like this. Allah is basically a good guy. He means well. He tries. But no matter how hard he tries to say what he means, the word just won't come out right. He gets all tongue-tied. He wants to say, go out and create peace. Create peace with other people. Promote religious harmony and tolerance. But it comes out, fight those who do not believe in Allah. Allah has some sort of cosmic Tourette syndrome where he blurts out things he doesn't really mean. Nadir, that's your God? That's your God who claims to speak perfectly, clearly? A God who gets all tongue-tied and gets his words twisted and misleads even his own prophet and all of his followers? Nadir, I I'll just be honest, I that doesn't sound like God to me. That sounds like stuttering Stanley. As I said, as I said, the debate is basically over. Now he's just kind of quibbling tonight. He's coming up with his own interpretations. And uh, for example, the Quran said, "And who, whoever seeks a religion other than Him, it will never be accepted of Him." Yes, God will not accept any other religion other than Islam. But now he's trying to somehow, you know, hang on in this debate, and he tried to misquote, try to misinterpret this Quranic verse to mean you never accept it from them. Okay, fine, I won't accept it. Even if we go along with your interpretation, fine. You tell me, uh, you're a Christian? Fine, I'll accept that. All right, so that doesn't prove, <laughs> that doesn't prove anything. It was basically a cheap attempt, because as I said, he's finished tonight. The, the Hadith of Ka'bi Malik is very clear. I'll just keep repeating it, you know, because he doesn't seem to want to address the Hadith of Kabi Malik. If you offer peace, we will accept it. And make you partners in peace and war. Now remember, he said, if the Prophet Muhammad said, I have been ordered to fight the people until they testify. Right, David. This Hadith is explaining that. It says, if you offer peace, we will accept it. And make you partners in peace and war. If you refuse, we shall fight you as long as we live till you turn to Islam. So let me now, uh, let me give him more evidence tonight. Obviously, you notice he's really not directly um, uh, refuting this hadith which I'm giving him. He keeps hanging on to a commentary as if it is God's word, but he's already been refuted by other people on that. That commentaries are not evidence in Islam. Now let me read this hadith for you, and I hope this will finish him off. You know, and he can just accept, yes, my dear, Muslims can live at peace with other non-Muslims. There is nobody on earth, who, no scholar on earth who said, peace is haram. You know what the word haram means? The word haram means forbidden. There is no scholar, there is no one, this is your Davidian interpretation of Islam. 
but no Muslims believe in this. It has never existed. Even you talk about the biggest whack jobs like Al Qaeda, even they don't believe in that nonsense. So peace, living in peace with non-believers, it is not haram. We will not burn in hell for that. Okay. So now let me go ahead and read this hadith to you. The pagans were of two kinds <coughs> as regards to their relationship with Muhammad and the believers. Some of those are who the Prophet were at war with and they used to fight against him and he used to fight against them. The others were those who the Prophet made a treaty with and neither did the Prophet fight them, neither did they fight him. This is, so I also once again we see more confirming evidence for what I'm saying. But David said everybody should be fought for being non-believers. We already exposed that nonsense. It's not written in the Quran. Thank you, Nadir. Muhammad never taught it. Which part of fight those who do not believe in Allah isn't clear? I find it very ironic that I seem to have more respect for the communication ability of the Quran than Muslims do. Fight those who do not believe in Allah, perfectly clear as the Quran claims to be. Even we turn to Muhammad's claims. I have been commanded to fight people until they say, La ilaha illallah. But according to Nadir, no, Ka bin Malik speaks more clearly than both Muhammad and Allah. Do you not see why a classical Muslim, a Muslim not raised in the United States of America, would find this appalling? You are saying, Allah Almighty, Allah Almighty claims to speak perfectly clearly. But his words say, fight those who do not believe. And so we need someone to come along and explain what Allah really means. We need someone like Nadir to come along and clarify it for the rest of us. We need someone to say, this is what this verse actually means. It doesn't mean what it says, because what it says is, fight those who do not believe in Allah. What Muhammad said is, I've been commanded to fight people until they say, la ilaha illallah. And so you have Ibn Kathir and Orthodox Muslims for centuries who say, Muhammad means exactly what he says. And then the Western Muslims, influenced, it seems, more by the Bill of Rights than they have by their scriptures, come and say, no. All of our classical commentators got it wrong. We know. We know what Allah really meant, and we can say it more clearly than he can. We can explain it for all of you. But when the Quran claims, as it does, to be fully explained, what need is there for further explanation by westernized Muslims? And why did Allah wait so long to give us people who can explain the Quran for us? I mean, think about it, centuries of violence, 270 million people killed in the name of Islamic Jihad because Allah couldn't make himself clear enough until the 21st century. That's your God? Again, I find it amazing that I have more respect for the Quran and for the Hadith and for Muhammad than Muslims do. I at least have the respect to let the texts mean what they say. Westernized Muslims are not giving the Quran even that degree of respect. Yeah, you know, as I said, this guy's toast. You know, the debate ended a long time ago. Um, you know, we're just going back and forth. He's just being stubborn. He does not want to accept the Hadith of Kabi Malik. He says, what part of fight those who believe in Allah is not clear. I have accepted that, absolutely. Muslims have been ordered to fight non-believers. And I argued and I showed you tonight that there is a moral obligation for that. There is a necessity for that. They were a clear and present danger. But see, the whole thing is that I, I want that in the text. Show me that in the text. Because this could all be a coincidence. Muhammad, yes, they are a clear and present danger. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's true. And. Um, there might be a moral obligation to, to fight them. Yeah, okay, fine, you're right, dear. You're not, but that's not what Muhammad meant. He didn't mean that. He meant something else. This is his argument tonight. So, actually, I'm just kind of 
waiting. I'm going to go ahead and give him the verse of the Quran. We show that Muhammad meant to do what he did. That's all I have to do tonight. Because this is his argument. He said 270 million people killed in Jihad. That's actually nonsense. There's no evidence for that. He's just making up stories. Like I said, he's been pretty much finished by the Hadith of Kabi Malik. He says, when Muhammad said, I have been ordered to fight the people until they testify, there's no God but Allah. You know, the Hadith of Kabi Malik explains that. I'm just going to keep repeating it. I don't even think you know what I'm talking about. He doesn't even know what I'm talking about. And unfortunately, I think, unfortunately, uh, David Wood is, is, is ignorant on our sources. And I'm going to ask him, what, what reference am I giving here? He's pretending to have knowledge, which he doesn't have. I'm going to challenge him. What reference am I quoting from this hadith of Kabi Malik? And I'll read, I'll read it again for you. If you offer peace, we will accept it and make you partners in peace and war. If you refuse, we will fight you. We shall fight as long as we live till you turn to Islam. What am I quoting from? What book am I quoting from, by the way? I could be just making this up, by the way. Let's see if David Wood knows. Now, he also quoted the Quran, and I forgot to address it. I just didn't have time. The Quran said, and do not seek peace when you have the upper hand. That actually is very good advice, but if you seek peace when you have the upper hand, it's going to be interpreted as a sign of weak weakness. But what if they ask you for peace? Fine, we will not seek peace, but if they seek peace, well, you are to offer, if you offer peace, we will accept it and make you partners in peace and war. This is not about me being a westernized Muslim. This is about him really not knowing this hadith of Kabi Malik. And he's trying to wing it tonight. He's trying to say, oh, I'm westernized, but I don't think so. What reference am I quoting from? Let me know. <coughs> Well, I'd be interested in knowing the source, too. Uh, because when I read the Muslim sources, I see a very different picture. But think about how Islam works, according to Nadir. Suppose, God forbid, I become a Muslim. Suppose Nadir offers some amazing evidence that Islam is true. I become a Muslim. Nadir hands me a Quran. I open it up. This is a clear book. This is fully explained. This is fully detailed. This tells you exactly what you need to do. I say, okay, awesome. Finally, a very clear book that tells me exactly what I need to do. I open it up. Fight those who do not believe in Allah, nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden which has been forbidden by Allah's messenger, etc. According to the Quran, that's perfectly clear. Right? But suppose I say, you know... Not what I was raised to do. Uh, I want to be careful. If I'm actually going to go out and fight people, I want, to be, I want to be clear on this. So where do I go? Well, I have to go outside of the fully explained book, right? I have to go outside of the book that explains all things and has been expounded in detail. Because if I just go with this, I would go out and fight unbelievers, as the verse commands. If I want to know why I'm fighting these unbelievers, I would look. It tells me. They don't believe in Allah, they don't believe in the last day, they don't forbid the same things that Muslims forbid, they don't acknowledge the religion of truth, so you fight them. If I want to know more, hmm, maybe the context tells me. I look to the next verse, Jews and Christians commit shirk. Okay, that's what the fully explained book tells me. But suppose I want to go outside of this for further confirmation. I go to Muhammad, who says over and over again, over and over again, I've been commanded to fight people until... They recite the Shahada. I say, well, there I have clear, clear confirmation. I have Allah telling me to fight the unbelievers because they're unbelievers. And I have Muhammad telling me to fight the unbelievers because they're unbelievers. Nadir's methodology says, no, 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 no. Then you have another source, Ka. You go to Ka and say, Ka, it wasn't clear enough in the Quran. And it wasn't clear enough when Muhammad said it. And so I need this sort of person who is uh, three times removed from Allah to explain what I am supposed to do. Well, what you're really telling me then is, if I become a Muslim and you give me the Quran, the Quran is not enough. The Quran will mislead and misguide me. If you then give me all of Muhammad's claims, I will be further misled and misguided. And what you have to do ultimately is give me, not the works of Ibn Kathir, because Ibn Kathir agrees with everything I'm saying, 
you have to give me the quotations from Cobb. And then Cobb, who understood Islam better than Muhammad and better than Allah, he'll make things clear for you. And you'll know you in peace. I told you he's ignorant. No, no, no offense. He's very, he wants to know what reference I'm quoting from. Don't pretend to have knowledge which you don't have. Because you don't want to do that in debates. Should I tell him? What do you think? Or should I just let him keep guessing? Keep letting him suffer tonight. So he's trying to wing it. He's trying to just digest the information I'm giving him and just trying to come out with explanation. Why should I follow Kabi Mahler? You know, if you haven't studied the situation, what you need to do is say, Nadir, I'm sorry. Whoa, 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 I'm sorry. Well, actually, I don't know about that. That's what I do. Hey, I don't know everything, but I don't try to wing it up here. I know he was ignorant of the situation. You know, he's ignorant of the references. It's taken from Sira Ibn Yishab. I got the page number for you. I'll let you look at it. And I even bought it for me. I bought it for him also. So, he can go ahead and look it up, but don't talk about things you don't know about. Okay? These th things are just not clear. You know, I'm, I'm blue in my face just quoting the same hadith over and over again. I think it's clear here. Okay? I think it's clear over here. Well, is this clear for you? Uh, remember the hadith I quoted from Sahih Muslim? It's all over the Quran and hadith. You read about this. Or to live in peace with, with uh, your fellow citizens. There is no Muslim today or Islamic scholar, even Al-Qaeda, those crazy lunatics, Taliban, hooligans, or, they don't believe in this. That to, to live in peace with non-Muslims is haram. We're going to burn in hell. There's no one who believes in this. This is your Davidian interpretation of Islam. Okay? So now, I hope this is clear for you. The pagans were of two kinds as regards to the relationship to the prophet and the believers. Some of them are those who fought, uh, uh, whom the prophet was at war with, and he used to fight against, and they used to fight him. And the others were those with whom the prophet made a treaty with, neither did they uh, fight the prophet, nor did he fight them. And there was a treaty of peace. So this debunks this nonsense. First of all, there is no evidence, you know, that you know you should fight all non-believers. This is not taught in the Quran. This is not taught in any canonical scripture. It's found in a commentary. But even if that's true, it doesn't matter. The debate is over with the Hadith of Kabi Malik. He says, why should I follow Kaab B. Malik? There's no need to answer that because he's unfortunately ignorant of the situation. The reason why you'd fight it was because Muhammad was standing right there and had Kaab B. Malik recite the Creed of Jihad whole world can understand that Muslims can live in peace with non-believers if you want peace. Okay? Um, let's see, i got about 10 more seconds. If you notice the seven arguments on my website, or I'm sorry, that I've given you, he has not refuted. The only thing i got to do now, he said he wants it specifically written in the Quran, where does it say that I have been, I'm fighting these people because they're committing oppression against people? Chapter 4, verse 75. I Thank gave you, you that. Well, I actually looked up that passage. <laughs> Nero was quoting. I think I'm going to read it. Do I have one more? Do I have one more three minutes after this? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and read it for you since this was the most peaceful uh, passage Nadir could come up with. Uh, you're in for a real, real treat. So let's see what happens when we read that in context. Uh, but again, we need to go. So, so even, even, even if this passage weren't violent, think about what Nadir is telling us. Every time I quote Ibn Asaq to a Muslim, he says, I don't believe in Ibn Asaq. No, no, no. You quote the Quran to me, and you quote our six collections of ahadith, or don't quote anything to me at all. And we open the Quran, it says fight the unbelievers. We open the hadith, it says fight the unbelievers. And now Muslims are to go, not to Allah, not to Muhammad, but to a book that every time I quote it, I am rebuked by Muslims, rebuked and ridiculed. Think about this, this is not hard to figure out. This is not hard to figure out at all. Clear book, clear book, fully explained, explained in detail. Fight those who do not believe in Allah. Nadir says, means something else. 
Why couldn't Allah have said what he means? Why couldn't Allah, if he means, fight people who commit genocide, why could the perfectly clear Quran not say, fight those who commit genocide? If Allah, the God who speaks with perfect clarity, had meant, fight those Christians who are killing and slaughtering Jews, why couldn't he have said that? Why would Allah say the most misleading thing he could possibly say? Again, again, I ask this again because I'd like to hear it addressed. If the President of the United States were to say to the American military, fight Muslims, they get a memo. It says, fight Muslims, kill Muslims. Would you think it reasonable at all if later on, when people react and say, oh, what a, what a, what a bigot, what a, what a hate monger, what an Islamophobe commanding soldiers to kill Muslims. Would you think it's a perfectly reasonable defense to say, well, what I meant was fight the, the, those particular Muslims who are attacking the United States and terrorizing us. That's what I really meant. Wouldn't you say, how dare you, how dare you give such a misleading, misrepresented verse? How dare you do that? How dare you do that? Look how much bloodshed would result because you're not clear. And that's what the deer tells us about his God. His God is not as clear as anyone in this room. that you just looked up the passage I was giving you? You did? What page number? 587, 588. Okay, so you just read it all and you understand it now. I skimmed it. I oh, saw okay. enough. To... All right. I've heard enough. All right. You know, um, and I want to apologize about those Muslims who ridicule you for quoting Ibn Ishaq and say, oh, this is all weak and nice. Well, but again, that's kind of your fault because you, unfortunately, and this is kind of one of my criticisms, you do tend to seek people who are kind of ignorant on Islam to debate with, okay? So he's continuing not to address the hadith where the Prophet where we talked about, but the two kind of disbelievers, those whom the Prophet was at war with and those whom he wasn't at war with. Neither did they fight him, nor did he fight them. Peace is not haram in Islam. That is 100% unanimous agreement among all the scholars. And the, and the ridiculous part about it, even terrorists agree with that, is not Haram in Islam. So the debate is pretty much over. He wants things. He just thinks the Quran is not clear. I think it's pretty clear to me. Uh, at least from the Hadith and the passage. Yes, the Quran does teach violence against non-believers. Absolutely, absolutely. But we gave you the historical content. He said he wants it written got to be written in the Quran that is because the Christians were committing horrible, horrible oppression and that's the reason why. I shouldn't have to do this. But I'll do it for you. Chapter 22, verse 40 of the Quran. It says over there, For had it not been that Allah checks one set of people by means of another, checks one set of people by means of another. So God is bringing these jihadists out of the Arabian Peninsula to check the Christians. Look what the good Lord said. He said, monasteries, churches, synagogues, and mosques where Allah's name is mentioned would surely have been pulled out. That's, I believe, what you're looking for. So jihad, according to chapter number 22, verse 40. So God, and I don't know, I can't explain this. Why does God want the worship of false religions? I don't know, I don't know. That part... I can honestly tell you, I don't know. But he said, the reason why I bring these jihadists out of the Arabian Peninsula, he said, because monasteries, churches, synagogues, where, and mosques, where Allah's name is mentioned, would surely have been told. Of. And who were the greatest persecutors? Who were the people who were torturing people and, and killing anyone who did not accept Christ as Lord and Savior? They were the Christians. They were the Christians who were doing this. 
And there were the never-ending wars between the pagans and, and the Christians. And so, yes, Allah does teach to fight against non-believers. Thank you. Well, I'm glad I'm finally allowed to quote uh, Ibn Asaf. Let's see how Islam works very briefly. You become a Muslim. You go to the Quran. It will mislead you if you just read the Quran. Because the Quran will tell you that you are to fight unbelievers, and the Quran will say, this book is fully explained. You don't need anything else. But Muslims will tell you, in order to be orthodox, you also have to go to the Hadith. You go to the Hadith, you see that you are supposed to fight people until they become Muslims. Those are the general sources that I am told by Muslims that I have to quote if I want to talk about Islam. That's what I've done this evening. But Nadir has come along and said, no, you have to go to the Sira literature. Now, just for the record, I think the Sira is a, a better historical source. And that's why um, I, I'm glad that this will be open uh, in future debates with Nadir. This is from Kab bin Malik. Our leader, the prophet, firm, pure of heart, steadfast, continent, straightforward, full of wisdom, knowledge, and clemency, not frivolous nor light-minded. We obey our prophet. You obey him when he says to fight unbelievers? We obey our prophet and we obey a Lord who is the compassionate, most kind to us. Most kind to us. If you offer peace, we will accept it and make you partners in peace and war. How are you going to make peace with the Muslims? If you refuse, we will fight you doggedly. It will be no weak, faltering affair. We shall fight as long as we live till you turn to Islam, humbly seeking refuge. We will fight not caring whom we meet, whether we destroy ancient holdings or newly gotten gains. How many tribes assembled against us, their finest stock and allies? They came at us thinking they had no equal, and we cut off their noses and ears with our fine, polished Indian swords driving them violently before us to the command of God and Islam until religion is established just and straight and Allah and Alusa and Wood are forgotten and we plunder them of their necklaces and earrings for they have become established and confident and he who cannot protect himself must suffer disgrace. This is Nadir's evidence that Islam does not promote violence towards non-believers. This is his best case. He couldn't go to the Quran, couldn't go to the Hadith, he goes to the Sira literature and a quote by one of Muhammad's soldiers who says, we fight them, we cut off their noses until they become Muslims. I think we have our answer to our topic.